balm. Um, it's acting like a balm to try to solve the inflammatory problem. So if we can work on reducing the inflammation, we can work on reducing how dangerous the cholesterol actually is to us. I also want to rock your world and say like, listen, there are some settings where statin medications are simply not indicated, right? So if you look at the ASCOT trial, this is the critical trial that brought Lipitor to market or atorvastatin, which was one of our very first like high dose um, or high intensity statin. So a little bit about history about statin medications. The first statin medication, lovastatin, was actually isolated from a natural product of red yeast rice. And this is a very common supplement that you may see some of your patients on. So statin medications were derived from a natural product. Statin medications go on a scale of hydrophilic and hydrophobic, right? So some of them love water. Others do not love water. The ones that love water tend to be your less intense statins. So your lovastatin, your, your um, provastatins. The ones that love fat are the more high intensity statins like atorvastatin and rosuvastatin and then fluvastatin, which nobody uses anyways, is somewhere right in the middle, okay? So these high intensity statins carry a higher risk of side effects, okay? Let me tell you a way that you can change your patient's life when they are taking statins. In Japan, it is mandated by law that every statin prescription also accompany a CoQ10 prescription. Many of you may know that the most common side effects of statin medications are muscle pains, muscle weakness, and brown urine as a symptom of rhabdomyolysis and muscle breakdown. Muscle breakdown is really, really bad because it is one of the root causes of insulin resistance. Sarcopenia is a huge cause of insulin resistance, and you can honestly, especially your postmenopausal women, you can change their life by encouraging them to lift weights. Because here's the thing, Statins increase the risk of diabetes in postmenopausal women. And in the ASCOT trial, in women who did not have a heart attack or a stroke before using a statin, there was no evidence that it, use of a statin could reduce the risk of death. And women who had not had a heart attack or a stroke and were placed on a statin had 10% more heart attacks than the women who were given placebo in the ASCOT trial. There is a very big differentiator between men and women and the use of statin medications. So why do people get muscle breakdown and pain? Okay. So the way that statins work is they inhibit an, an enzyme called HMG-CoA reductase. And HMG-CoA reductase is what is called the rate limiting step in the production of cholesterol. So your rate limiting step in, in all of these enzyme processes that have to occur over time, the rate limiting step is the one that happens the slowest. So if you can stop that step from happening, you stop the entire cascade, okay? So when we inhibit that enzyme, there's a major problem. HMG-CoA reductase also is responsible for the production of CoQ10. CoQ10 is what cleans up all of the mess that your mitochondria make as they fuel your body to make energy. So remember back to our like eighth grade biology that we have the powerhouse of the cell. Unfortunately, the powerhouse is a messy little mistress who produces a lot of free radicals as it produces energy. Free radicals create chains of inflammation. And remember, cholesterol in and of itself is not dangerous in the absence of inflammation. So if we don't have CoQ10, we increase the inflammatory load of the body and we increase the inflammatory load specifically on our musculature. And so if you see a patient on a statin medication that is also not on a CoQ10 
medication or a CoQ10 supplement, excuse me, there's a ton of them out there on the market. They're freely available at every pharmacy. Um, and they're complaining of muscle pain and weakness. You have two choices. Number one, your high intensity fat loving statins are more likely to cause these problems. So you can switch to a lower potency water soluble statin like lovastatin or provastatin, or you could do what they do in Japan and mandate that every single person take a CoQ10 supplement alongside a statin medication. You can prevent so many side effects if you are, if you're working on if we're going to take medications, can we at least do it safely, right? That's my shtick as a pharmacist. And it's my shtick about supplements too. Like if you're going to take a supplement, can you ensure that you're not like taking a supplement that's going to do you harm? So what else do we know about really low serum cholesterols, right? We know that it can increase the risk of diabetes in postmenopausal women. We know that women who have not had heart attacks or strokes and take a statin actually have an increased risk of heart attacks. And I know this is boggling your mind, but take a big step back. And this is well-documented. This is not a conspiracy theory. Eight of the 15 people who wrote the guidelines for cholesterol were also paid by the pharmaceutical industry. So we have to take a big step back. There's a great New York Times op-ed um, written by a physician out of Stanford way back in like 2012 entitled Stop Giving Patients So Many Statins. And it's because over the course of years, we've continued to lower and lower and lower and lower and lower the LDL goal while not assessing ApoB, LDL particle size, C-reactive protein is a great sign of, of inflammation in the body. And so we need to look at better labs because we know that having a low serum cholesterol increases the risk. So these people that were pushing their cholesterol down to less than 70 increases the risk of ischemic stroke, increases the risk of intracranial hemorrhage, and well known to change our mood and our behaviors because when you don't have enough cholesterol, cholesterol is the grandfather of all of our sex steroids. So when you artificially lower cholesterol, you're also throwing estrogen, testosterone, and progesterone out of balance, which can be very dangerous because estrogen has such a great role in protecting our bones and protecting our hearts. When we don't have enough testosterone, we don't have drive. We don't have that get up and go that helps us to get out of bed in the morning. And this in your menstruating women can cause all kinds of cycling problems. And in postmenopausal women, now we're increasing the risk of osteopenia and osteoporosis, which is never a good thing. So what do we do about all of this, right? We have to move further upstream. Remember, functional medicine is about turning off the faucet, right? So we have to look at genes. If you have an APOE deficiency, you're probably going to have familial hypercholesterolemia. We also have to look at our environment. What toxins are we exposed to that can raise blood pressure and raise our cholesterol? Lifestyle. Lifestyle is so um, important. And a lot of the lifestyle advice that we have been given is a little bit off. It's a little bit off. Um, so we talk about we talk about salt. We talk about, um, you know, eating fruits and vegetables and exercise and this and that. But we have very good emerging evidence that's only about five years old to show that the root cause of high blood pressure and high cholesterol is not a salt problem. And it's certainly not a fat in the diet problem. It's a sugar in the diet problem. So fructose raises levels of uric acid. And uric acid, you're probably thinking like, oh, gout, right? But uric acid levels will be elevated for years and years and years, causing high blood pressure and high cholesterol far before any type of gout type symptoms emerge. 
So look up the, the recent research that's coming out about simple sugars like fructose driving the incidence of cardiometabolic disease. And it's also driving uh, obesity rates as well. So we have to stop demonizing salt. Um, you would die without salt. Now we can encourage our patients to eat better salts, right? The iodized Morton's crap is doing nothing to keep your patients healthy, but you can use gray salts, black salts, pink salts. There's, there's lots of red salts. There's lots and lots and lots of different salts out there that are inherently safer for consumption because they contain multi-minerals alongside just the sodium. For your patients that are on your ACE inhibitors, like so all of your PRIL drugs, your lisinopril, your monopril, your enalapril, all your PRIL drugs, those are ACE inhibitors. We have to ensure that they're not using salt substitutes as well, right? So our salt substitutes typically use potassium as the source of saltiness. And because the ACE inhibitors, as well as the ARBs, your angiotensin receptor blockers, those are your sartan drugs, both of those increase the risk of hyperkalemia and you know, we all have heard, at least I hope we all have heard, you never push potassium because an overload of potassium will stop the heart instantly. We don't want to be pushing hyperkalemia in our patients because it's dangerous, it's hard on the kidneys, et cetera. So we can use better salts, but we have to focus on sugar. You have to focus on specifically on fructose. You have to focus specifically on fructose if you want these markers of, of, of inflammation to come down. We also know that up under basically every cardiometabolic problem is insulin resistance, right? So insulin resistance leads to hyperinsulinemia, right? So you, you've got way too much insulin and your cells are just like, I don't care, right? So insulin resistance leads to hyperinsulinemia, which leads to a compensated effect where your, your cardiovascular system is trying to correct this, this hyperinsulinemia. And the only way that it knows how to do it is through fat storage. So now we're starting to get obesity. Now we're starting to get non-alcoholic um, liver disease and ultimately leads to cardiometabolic syndrome. So cardiometabolic syndrome, we've got that low HDL, we've got an elevated blood pressure, we've got that large waist circumference. Um, and so we need to ensure like diabetes is a spectrum, right? Cardiovascular disease is a spectrum. And you will have another lab that you can ask for is a fasting insulin right? So if fasting insulin is going to tell you so much more than an A1C or a, um, or a fasting uh, blood sugar will, because oftentimes your insulin level will be elevated 10, 15 years before the onset of diabetes. So that's another great lab to ask for. We also have to look at the downstream. So our upstream stuff that we look at is genes, our environment, our lifestyle, our inflammation, our oxidative stress, the insulin dysfunction that we have at baseline. Where Western medicine tends to focus is on the downstream effects of your body mass index, your blood sugar, your LDL, and your blood pressure. But there's so much that we can look at before any of those things become a problem. So in functional medicine, we say, stop trying to pour water on the house fire and figure out why it's on fire in the first place, right? So we don't want to just like throw drugs and throw things at the problem. We want to look at why does the problem exist in the first place. And this is a difficult thing to shift your mindset around. But once you get there, you can totally get there. So insulin really, really matters in cardiometabolic disease. It, it, it messes up glucose. 
it causes problems in fat mobilization. Um, it messes up our overall metabolism, which is now throwing off our thyroid. It messes up our mitochondrial function and it causes a cytokine cascade, tons of oxidative stress and inflammation. And it also throws off our adrenals and our sex steroids. And so I know a lot of people say that adrenal fatigue is like not a thing shift your mindset a little bit. Adrenal fatigue is not adrenal fatigue. Adrenal fatigue is a, is a known consequence of being under chronic stress. It's a known consequence of being under chronic stress where in order to save your life, your adrenals cut themselves off. And they say, we cannot make more cortisol because we're already a house on fire. Okay. So a lot of times people will test for cortisol a better test for it is a four point cortisol. All right. So a four point cortisol is a salivary test where you look at cortisol throughout the day so that you can make sure that you've actually got the um, correct amount of cortisol in the morning in the mid morning, in the afternoon and at night. Okay. So I promise you we're going to get to the, um, to the guidelines we know. So let's start with our cholesterol guidelines. Cholesterol guidelines were most recently updated in 2021. They're joint written by the American Heart Association, American uh, College of Cardiology, and they are designed to help us figure out how do we reduce the risk of not just cardiovascular disease, I really want you to walk away today with this understanding that this is a metabolic problem. This is a cardiometabolic problem. So to say that it's just cardiovascular is too narrow. One of the major problems in Western medicine is we try to piecemeal the body, right? So you have your cardiologist, your nephrologist, your endocrinologist, um, your primary care provider, your OBGYN, you've got all these different care providers only looking at one body system. In functional medicine, you have to look at the entire body as a whole, okay? So the cholesterol guidelines set our cholesterol targets. They also do, they also use the Framingham risk score, which I don't love, but it is a way that you can look at a patient's 10-year risk of developing atherosclerotic uh, cardiovascular disease. The Framingham risk score is a calculator. You can look it up online and it accounts for age, sex, race, blood pressure, cholesterol levels, whether or not they smoke and whether or not they have diabetes at baseline. Um, I encourage you, um, every single care provider within the entire care team should be an active participant in discouraging smoking. And so you can, the way I say it is, Hey, I noticed that you're, that you are a, you know, what we talk about in, in pharmacy is the number of pack years that people have. So the number of pack years is how many packs of cigarettes a day do you smoke multiplied by the number of years. So if you're a pack a day smoker for five years, you have a five year pack history. If you are two pack a day smoker for 10 years, you have a 20 pack, you have a 20 year pack history. And so you can just tell people, hey, I noticed that you're an active smoker, that you have this long-standing history. I explain what a pack history is. And then I just say, as your pharmacist, I strongly discourage you from smoking. I actively encourage you to quit. Are you prepared to set a quit date within the next 30 days? Because we can't give arbitrary goals to patients. We have to use our SMART goals. And so you have to put a time to it. And so actively encourage patients to quit smoking because we do know that it is a cause of insulin resistance. And remember, insulin resistance is the root cause of all cardiometabolic disease. So you have your Framingham risk score. We also know that our cholesterol guidelines, slightly different lifestyle modifications than the blood pressure guidelines. Lifestyle changes are recommended as first line of defense. I mean, I can almost hear you guys laughing inside of your head because we do such a terrible job at truly educating and encouraging deep, profound lifestyle changes in our patients. 
where patients are truly sleeping eight to nine hours a night and truly exercising every single day and truly like drinking their gallon of water every single day where we really are encouraging people to make genuine lifestyle changes. Um, I get asked about diet a lot. Which diet do I want your patient to use? The one that they will actually do. I don't care what it is as long as they will actually do it and as long as it's not. So in functional medicine, we call it SAD, the standard American diet. It is SAD. And some people, um, some people call it, um, you know, a terrible American diet, but the standard American diet is so pro-inflammatory and it is so responsible for this hyperinsulinemia that is causing the problems. All right. So we in, um, in functional medicine, we talk about our ATMs. So our ATMs are our antecedents. So what predated this, what's our trigger and then what mediates it, what modulates it, what mediates it. So in addition to these lifestyle changes that we need to be looking at, we're looking at stress, we're looking at genes, we're looking at inflammation, and the lifestyle can be the hugest component of the inflammation. We have to look at the microbiome. There are um, there are certain bacteria that if you are colonized with these bacteria, you will not ever be obese. And if you lack these bacteria, you will always stay obese. And so we need to be encouraging basically every patient under the sun to be taking probiotic supplements. And we need to be using strain specific probiotics so that we actually know what they do. Lifting weights is another huge lifestyle modification. I mentioned sarcopenia as a cause of insulin resistance. It's specifically laid out in um, many guidelines that lifting weights is critical. And the heavier the weight that you can get, the better. Um, there is research to show that even if you can only do one rep, doing one rep at the heaviest weight that you can possibly tolerate has huge benefits in helping to prevent insulin resistance, high cholesterol, and high blood pressure, okay? We also, um, as far as diets go, I said the one that the patient will stick to. The Mediterranean diet, I think, has the best research behind it um, as far as being a heart-healthy diet. In the guidelines for cholesterol, statin medications are your first go-to med for the lowering of cholesterol. But we have to ask ourselves, why are we lowering cholesterol, okay? So in pharmacy research, there is this concept of what's called dose versus poems, right? So dose versus poems, um, those are disease oriented endpoints. That's where you say like, oh, we've lowered their LDL. Hooray. But you don't care if you lower your LDL. What do you actually care about? You care about the patient oriented evidence that matters. Do you have a heart attack? Do you have a stroke? Do you die? Right? So we have a lot of great evidence for statins that is disease oriented endpoints. We don't have as much of this patient-oriented evidence that matters, especially in women. However, according to the guidelines, we have our um, statins as our primary therapies. And so statins decrease LDL, they decrease triglycerides, they slightly increase HDL, but they cause muscle pain. They increased blood sugar levels and are a known trigger. They are a known trigger. So a, a this is the ATMs, known trigger for diabetes. They also can cause constipation, nausea, diarrhea, stomach pain, cramps, and they elevate LFTs, which is a major problem because hyperinsulinemia is the root cause of all cardiometabolic disease, which causes fatty liver. And so now you've got this one-two punch, right? We also have our azetamibe therapy, um, decreases LDL, uh, slightly de decreases uh, triglycerides, slightly increases HDL. Um, 
when you think of azetamide, this is a cholesterol absorption inhibitor. Um, and so it only works within the GI tract. Like this one is not a systemically available medication. It works within the GI tract. So all of our, most of our side effects are going to be related to stomach pain, diarrhea, um, this is one that has a higher risk in um, pregnancy. So too do the statins have a higher risk in pregnancy. So we do need to use caution in women who are pregnant. Um, azetamide, we also have to be careful when women are, are lactating. The newer form of medications, uh, the PCSK9 inhibitors, these are monoclonal antibodies, right? And monoclonal antibodies are ridiculously more expensive than our old school statins. So for patients facing sociogenomic problems as a root cause of their disease, we definitely want to steer towards an off-patent statin, lovastatin, provastatin, fluvastatin, atorvastatin's off-patent um, by now. And so we need to be sure that we're driving towards these cheap, inexpensive um medications and not going for the more expensive medications. PCSK9 inhibitors are typically only used in people who have APOE problems. Um, that APOE problems can cause really high cholesterol levels. So if you have a patient in their 20s with like an LDL of like 250, do not pass go, do not collect $200, immediately test for APOE um, genomics because you're going to find out that they have familial hypercholesterolemia. There's no reason that someone that young, unless they have been obese since they were a child, maybe they were born a 10, 12 pound baby. Um, et cetera. So um, there is, there's not a lot of great reasons that we need to be using these monoclonal antibodies unless people have failed statin therapy and the statin therapy needs to be optimized by using a CoQ10 supplement, using the lowest dose possible, and preferably using one of the lower intensity hydrophilic statins versus one of the higher intensity hydrophobic or hyd uh, yeah hydrophobic statins. So don't graduate to these PCSK9 inhibitors unless you have to. Um, they, they cause bruising, they are an injection, they're expensive, they can cause local swelling, itching, um, and pain. So use these more for last line agents. Another uber cheap old class of medications is your bile acid sequestrants. These are cholestyramine, colcivelum, and cholestopol. Old as crap medicines, decrease LDL, may slightly increase HDL. These again work within the gut. So our side effects are going to be primarily gut based. So constipation, bloating, nausea, gas, heartburn. There's also a lot of drug interactions with bile acid sequestrant. So any medication that absorbs things, um, you can, you can, uh, you can really know that they're going to cause going to cause problems. Um, and then our next class of, of medications is our citrate lyase inhibitors. Um, this is um, bempedoic acid or nexlitol. These are a newer class of medications. They decrease um, LDL, but they mess up uric acid. And we know that uric acid is one of the root causes of cardiometabolic disease because of the research that we've done on fructose and how fructose increases uric acid. So these medications can drive gout flares while also elevating uric acid, which is also increasing the risk of cardiovascular disease. It just makes you sick to your stomach when you really start to look at it. We also have our niacin. Niacin, vitamin B3, helps to decrease LDL, increases HDL. Um, it does cause flushing. And so people can feel like they're kind of having like a, a hot flash. 
Um, you can mitigate the risk of it by taking many of these patients are on um, aspirin, low dose baby aspirin every day. If you take your aspirin 30 minutes before your niacin, you can reduce the risk of facial flushing. Problem with niacin is it also increases our blood sugar, right? So if you've got a statin medication alongside a niacin, and now all of a sudden you've got a new onset diabetes, it may be triggered. It may be, again, ATMs. It may be triggered by the medication usage. We also have our phenofibrates. Um, they're not used as much. These are used um, primarily to decrease, I'm sorry, uh, triglycerides. They only modestly decrease LDL and they do increase our HDL. Um, phenofibrate and uh, gemfibrozole, again, old, cheap drugs, um, great options for patients who struggle to afford their medications. Um, also, as you're getting out there, you guys have a big voice with the, the Alabama Nursing Association and the Alabama Social Work Association. As you are attending breakfasts down in Montgomery, talk to our state senators and talk to our Congress people about the fact that we are the only country, the only wealthy nation in the world where we do not have governmental oversight of drug pricing. And according to the Institute for Clinical and Economic Research, if we were to bring drug pricing within 20% of all other wealthy nations in the world, we would decrease the annual expenditure for medications in this country by $500 billion. And that's our tax money, people. And so we in the United States spend in excess of $2.3 trillion a year to live six years less than all other inhabitants of wealthy nations. And we have no governmental oversight of drug pricing, which is criminal at this point. Um, I actually am a candidate for a, for a diplomat in pharmacy law at the moment because this is so infuriating to me that we as an American people do not know just how badly we are getting ripped off by the pharmaceutical industry. And what's the worst news ever? It's literally hard coded in both um, the Affordable Care Act as well as the CARES Act of 2016. The drug companies literally got our Congress people, our senators to write it into legislation that the U.S. government will never have any oversight over drug pricing. So wish me well on my journey because if anybody can wrangle the pharmaceutical industry into submission it's this chick right here because it is criminal that we are charging people so much let's talk about the history of insulin right how many of your patients struggle to afford their insulin life saving medication for cardiometabolic disease okay I want you guys to all go back and reread the diabetes guidelines they come out every single January just three short years ago, the American Diabetes Association, right? I have a good job and I struggle to pay for my insulin. Christina, that is because the drug company completely manipulated doctors. So go back in time, right? We used to only have recombinant insulin, right? Recombinant insulin comes from an animal source, okay? So that's your insulin MPH and your insulin 7030s, right? Cheap, cheap, cheap drugs. What did the drug company do? They came out with what are called insulin analogs. These are your insulin glargines, your insulin aspartes. Then they went to physicians nationwide and with zero evidence to back it up, told physicians that these were safer because they cause less hypoglycemia. They don't. And they said that they were less allergenic because they're not from an animal source total blatant lie. It was only three years ago that the American Diabetes Association finally said, if your patient is struggling to afford their insulin because they're on an insulin glargine, they're on Lantus, they're on Aspart, whatever, you can just put them back on the recombinant insulin, which has the exact same risk of hypoglycemia and the exact same risk of allergenicity. They're a little bit harder to dose because if you, if you think about your pharmacokinetics, so 
Uh, pharmacokinetics are what our body does to drugs. Pharmacodynamics are what drugs do to our bodies, right? So kinetic wise, we know that insulin glargine or Lantus, the reason that you do it is because it stays stable all throughout the day. And then you use something like an aspart after meals, right? Your NPHs and your insulin 70-30s, they work more like this. So they're a little bit harder to dose. So work with a pharmacist. Pharmacists can be certified in advanced diabetes management. Um, we have very reasonable approaches to how we manage medications. And so, yes, if you're struggling to pay for insulin, get on a cheaper insulin, okay? Um, all right, we are so rapidly running out of time. For cholesterol, we also have our omega-3 fatty acids. You can take them over the counter. Um, there are also prescription versions as well. For our blood pressure, you have probably seen loads of different classes of medications that treat blood pressure. Um, interesting story, everybody's on HCTZ as like the di thiazide diuretic of choice. Believe it or not, all the drug research was done with chlorthalidone. So if you actually want to be practicing evidence-based medicine, all of these patients on HCTZ should be on chlorthalidone instead. The um, thiazide diuretics, they do act at the level of the kidney. And I want to be sure I teach you guys this. There is a combination of medicines that you will see over and over and over and over and over again in your career, and it's called the deadly kidney triad. If you want your patient to have end-stage renal disease, I want you to give them the combination of a diuretic, a loop diuretic, your furosemides, uh, bu budesonides are going to be more dangerous than your um, thiazide diuretics, okay? So a diuretic, an ACE inhibitor. Okay, so really common, right? Guess what the third drug is? That is your third part of the deadly kidney triad. Ibuprofen, right? So the reason that this is so deadly is because the at the level of the glomerulus inside of your kidney, you have your loop diuretic, which, which is going to drain and dehydrate the glomerulus. The glomerulus, a dehydrated glomerulus is the worst possible thing you could ever, ever have, okay? Then you have your ACE inhibitor, which expands your efferent arteriole, so the exit strategy is expanding, and then your ibuprofen is shrinking your afferent, so you're dehydrating your, your glomerulus in three different ways. You're shrinking the blood flow and the water flow in, you're expanding the water flow out, and then you're forcing more fluid out of your body with your diuretics, okay? Um, be aware of hyperkalemia. Most common side effect of your ACE inhibiting drugs is a chronic cough. Please keep this in mind. If you have a patient complaining of a chronic cough, they need to be switched from an ACE to an ARB. We have two different types of calcium channel blockers. The most common ones are gonna be your amlodipines. Just know that diltiazem and verapamil work in completely different ways. This is why we don't see them very often. Lesser known drugs are alpha blocking medications, your prazosins and your terazosins. And then you also have our clonidines and our methyl dopas. And then I'm a huge fan of the beta blockers. I think that they work really well if you are going to use a blood pressure lowering medication and you have a patient who has a, um, who has a stress component using something like a beta blocker may also may also help. So I know that took us all over the place and I hope that you learned something today. I know it was a slightly different approach than what you're probably used to, um, but loads of good information in there and would just absolutely love for you guys to come and listen to the podcast and just keep learning from me. I, Ms. Dean said what I was going to say, Dr. Elmore, since I really, before I speak, I should probably sew my scalp back on as you blow me <laughs> away. Um, and I, I'm convinced I have many of the things that you pronounced that I could never pronounce. And I know that I need a uh, functional medicine physician. 
So I've learned enough to probably have to shut down my brain for the rest of the day just to recover. Um, I, you've got so many kind comments here, as I'm, I'm sure you're reading. Thank you for being here. And, and as I say, with not all, but most of our guest speakers, you have a standing invitation and we'd love to have you back. But I know that you're a busy uh, person uh, and appreciate so much you making the time today. Um, I, I, uh, we're nearing the end of our hour. Do you have anything you'd like to add, Dr. Elmore? No, I wish that we had gotten down to talk more about Wagovi and with Ozempic because I know that you guys are probably getting loads and loads of questions. And so I'll just sum up just in 30 seconds. Do these medications cause weight loss? Sure. As soon as you stop taking it, you put all the weight back on and they cause sarcopenia, which we've learned over and over again today is one of the root causes of insulin resistance. So Encourage your patients to make lifestyle modifications, not to use the Band-Aids. Thank you so much. It's been a wonderful hour. Thank you all for being here. I hope you have a great week. And join us on Monday when Dr. Phyllis Marks, who's a PsyD, will share with us the genogram. This is new information to me. Apparently, it helps us to understand ourselves in a more uh, complete fashion so that we can be more uh, adapted or better adapted to be clinicians. So please join us on Monday of next week, the 31st. Thank you again, Dr. Elmore. It's been certainly our pleasure. Uh, and we uh, hope you all have a terrific week ahead. Thanks so much.